sound a little familiar. <laughs> Later, Jesus himself appeared again to his disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. This is how it happened. Simon Peter, Thomas called Didymus, Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee, Zebedee's sons, and two other disciples were together. Simon Peter told them, I'm going fishing. They said, we'll go with you. They set out in a boat, but throughout the night they caught nothing. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples didn't realize it was Jesus. Jesus called to them, children, have you caught anything to eat? They answered him, no. He said, cast your net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. So they did, and there were so many fish that they couldn't haul in the net. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it's the Lord. When Simon Peter heard it, it was the Lord, he wrapped his coat around himself, for he was naked, and jumped into the water. The other disciples followed in the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they weren't far from shore, only about a hundred yards. When they landed, they saw a fire there with fish on it and some bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish that you've just caught. Simon Peter got up and pulled the net to shore. It was full of large fish, 153 of them, yet the net hadn't torn even with so many fish. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. None of the disciples could bring themselves to ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came, took the bread and gave it to them. He did the same with the fish. This was now the third time Jesus appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. When they finished eating, Jesus asked Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Simon replied, yes, Lord, you know I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my lambs. Jesus asked a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Simon replied, yes, Lord, you know I love you. Jesus said to him, take care of my sheep. And he asked a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was sad that Jesus asked him a third time, do you love me? He replied, Lord, you know everything. You know I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. I assure you that when you were younger, you tied your own belt and walked around wherever you wanted. When you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and another will tie your belt and lead you where you don't want to go. He said this to show the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. After saying this, Jesus said to Peter, follow me. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Hey, you seated. Let's pray together. Uh, let's bow our heads. And would you please pray for me this morning as I preach that what I say would resonate with the Word of God. Pray for me. And now pray for yourself that as you hear this Word, you'd be open to what God has to say to you. And, and, and we pray this every week, and I don't know what you think about, but I particularly want to challenge you today to listen to what God has to say for you that might be different, new, a change of direction. Pray for yourself as you hear God's word. And third, and I'm going to change it up on you again this week, I want you to think of someone who's not here. Someone you go to school with, someone you work with, a neighbor, a family member. 
a neighborhood kid, somebody who's not here, and pray for them in light of this message. Just as a reminder, not necessarily that you would go talk to that person, maybe you should, but as a reminder of the people who aren't here, that we would listen to the word in such ways that it would go with us and we would speak forth into the world. So pray for that someone who's not here this morning. Father, as we receive what you've given us, both in the scriptures written a long time ago and what you have helped me to prepare this morning, show us Jesus. In his name, amen. Amen. So we have board meeting this week. Um, And, you know, there's some, our board meetings, they have different flavors. It's always the same wonderful time together. Um... But there are different times when we feel, you know, think something different is happening. And I shared a lot um, of my journey of this past year. Um, it was about this time last year that I began a conversation with uh, Dr. Corliss McGee at Eastern Nazarene College, and that led to a number of things. And, and I applied for that position and didn't get the position. And, but God exploded things after I didn't get it, which is the part you guys don't know about yet that I will share next week. But part of what the Lord has been saying to me about our church Um, is that there are a lot of people who aren't here who need to be, Uh, both in terms of salvation, also in terms of ministry, expanding ministry, um, and all sorts of things that the Lord is speaking to me about in these days. Now, if you you pay attention to the lectionary, which is me and Sarah, um, what we remember and know is this passage is often the third week of Easter. It's either one or two of the years in the lectionary. I didn't choose this passage this morning. Somebody, somebody's, a group of people chose it a while ago because it's a great story to talk about and to read through um, in the season of Easter. That's what we do in the season of Easter. We look at the post-resurrection accounts in the, in the Gospels. Now you know, and I don't, continue, I don't mean to continue to make this a joke, but you know that John 20 and 21 are a pretty big deal to me. Um, I, I love these chapters. I think they're pivotal for us in understanding who Christ is and who we are as, as his people. A couple months ago, we went through uh, the chapters 14 through 17 in John. I don't remember that. And it's, it, it contained a lot of things that Jesus talked about, the church particularly. And Jesus spends those four chapters in John uh, talking about what the future of the church will be like, that there will be persecution, and they've got to stick together. And the main heart of Jesus' prayer there in John 17 particularly is he says, God, I pray that they would be one as you and I are one. And we see the heart of, of Jesus' prayer for, for the church, that we would stick together, that regardless of most anything, we would stick together according to the oneness that we see between Jesus and the Father. And here in the post-resurrection accounts of John, the same gospel, we see some of this picture coming together, the, beginning, the beginnings of the church. We get a much bigger picture of it in Acts, the, the book of Acts. But here we see the beginning of the people of God, the disciples being the very beginning of the people of God, the church, and coming together and some of the things that we see, the characteristics of what we see. I encourage you to, to have this open in front of you. I'm just walking through John 21 Uh, what Ed just read for us this morning. Verse by verse. Later, Jesus himself appeared again to his disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. Now, the Sea of Tiberias uh, is not near Jerusalem. Uh, It's many miles away. It's it's in Galilee, where Jesus uh, came from and where Jesus actually eventually settled. Um, Right there, uh, the very northern part of the Sea of Galilee. And when I was there a couple of years ago, it was very helpful for me to sit there, literally on the shores, and we literally watched a fish jump. You can ask my dad, it happened. Uh, as we're sitting there, just jumped out of the water just to say hello to us. Didn't do that, but you know, it felt like it. And as I sat there and was able to envision where Jesus had chosen his, his hometown, Capernaum, um, for, during his ministry, it was a beautiful place. It really helped me understand some of the nature of Jesus. Yes, Jesus um, was a man of, of minimalism. He was one who didn't you know, carry possessions and didn't you know, build up you know, his portfolio or anything like that. He was a very simple man. He walked wherever he went, cause, not just because there were no cars, but because it's just the man he was. He met with people. He sat with people. But I've been to Capernaum. He picked a pretty beautiful place to retreat to, a wonderful place where the sun sets over the water and the mountains, 
Um, it's okay. In fact, we need those kinds of places. And this is apparently where Jesus is here um, when he appears to the disciples, the Sea of Tiberias. This is all how it happened. Simon Peter, Thomas called Didymus, Nathaniel from Cana and Galilee, Zebedee's sons, and two other disciples were together. That's seven if you're counting. Simon Peter told them, I'm going fishing. They said, we'll go with you. I'm going to do some dangerous things this morning with this passage. I want to read it in light of our church. And the really audacious thing is I want to offer to you the same words as Peter. In these months and years ahead, I'm going fishing. And my prayer is that you will respond with the same words as the rest of the disciples. We'll go with you. So they set out in a boat. Now, I've talked about boats and water in the biblical world, particularly in the past. You know, water in the biblical world is a thing of chaos. It's life and chaos, right? You have to have water to live. Jesus does that in chapter 4 of the same gospel, talking to the Samaritan woman, talking about the life-giving water. And yet, water, especially on the lake, on the sea, is a scary thing. It, remember, in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, sorry, in the Genesis story of creation, there's this chaos. It's the same kind of chaos. Where it says the, the wind swept over the waters. There's this unknownness in the waters. But the boat is a place of safety, a place where the disciples are together. And so they set out together in a boat and fished all night. But throughout the night, they caught nothing. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples didn't realize it was Jesus. Part of my role for you as pastor is to help us discern when God is talking to us. To, to know what is the voice of the Lord and what's just me or what might be resonating with the voice of the Lord and how do we know when that al- aligns up. I, I don't always know, but we do our best and we step out to, to hear and to do what Jesus is telling us. I believe we're in a time when Jesus is calling out to us. What does he say? Well, here in the scriptures, he says, children, have you caught anything to eat? Now, in the Greek, it's actually got a negative in there. Haven't you caught anything to eat? Which you know when somebody asks, when your mom asks you a question, haven't you cleaned your room? There's something behind that, right? Because your mom knows that you haven't cleaned your room. And the not in there means, I already know, but let's talk about it anyway. Right? And so Jesus says, haven't you caught anything to eat? And they answered him, no. Now, remember, they don't know that it's Jesus. And so they might have if they were out in the boat and the stranger said, haven't you caught anything? They say, yeah, we, we're good. We got plenty of things here. Everything is going just fine. But they didn't. They were honest and they said, No to this stranger who is Jesus. In these, in these times, I think we need to be honest with ourselves around here. Um, the pews are full today. And I love it. Even with many people missing. Um, the fact of the matter is, we've often been full like this in this chapel. And there's not really space, if not in here, certainly in the parking spaces around this building, uh, for many more people. And sometimes when these many more people do show up, or some more people on any given Sunday, I should say, they feel squeezed around here. And there's other things to think about in being honest with ourselves. We, and this has not stopped, and it's still the heart of our church, we love each other. And we have disagreements and we fight and we have differences and political differences and, and all sorts of different things. But in the end, we stick together. And we provide space for one another. And we provide resources for one another. And when someone's having a difficult time, we help each other. And this is good. And if we stop that, we'll lose the heart of who we are as North Street Community Church. And yet, this feature of us can be difficult when it comes to being who we are supposed to be as those who reach out to the world. We we can become and have, I believe, so comfortable in loving one another that it's very difficult for things to, to get in, other people to get in, to find their way in. 
this is some of the some of the things, and there's others we'll talk about that I think we need to be honest about. To say, when Jesus says, Are you catching anything? We need to be honest and say no. So that we can listen to what he says next. He says, Cast your net on the right side of the boat, and you will find some. Now, I, I appreciate Jordan's wisdom. And I think she's very smart in saying, well, yes, Pastor Jeremy, it was a smart thing to do because there were no fish on this side of the boat, and there were some fish on this side of the boat. But what we know is that difference of 10 feet, fish can swim and, you know, they could move right under the boat to the other side. That's an audacious request, Jesus. What a silly request. I mean, we're not talking about a cruise ship, like, you know, one part of the boat's in one part of the lake, the other part of the boat's in the other part of the lake. No, this is a small fishing boat. And to say moving the nets from here to over here is going to make any kind of difference is ridiculous. It's audacious. Oh, I want to share, but you have to come back next week about how the Lord, I believe, is asking us to shift just ever so slightly, but also in an audacious kind of way where we're casting, how we're casting our nets. The text says, so they did. And there were so many fish that they couldn't haul in the net. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it's the Lord. And when Simon Peter heard it was the Lord, he wrapped his coat around himself, for he was naked. I skipped that part with the kids, didn't I? Uh, I wasn't sure where that was going to go. Um, this isn't just a neat feature in John. Nothing is just a neat feature in John. John's intentional about every part of, every detail that he shares in his stories. Peter's exposed. The, and remember, Peter often typifies the whole, all of the disciples He's exposed. They are exposed. They don't know what they're doing. They need the Lord to tell them what to do. And what's even crazier is he should have just not put his clothes on. Who, who puts their clothes on to go swimming? I mean, it just shows the buffoonery that is the disciple, the disciples, and their utter, utter need for Jesus and his leadership. He was naked. He jumped into the water with his clothes on after that. And his other disciples followed in the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they weren't far from the shore, only about 100 yards. I'm going to feel, I already do feel a little bit like Peter in this, exposed, vulnerable. We've talked a lot around here, and I think we do pretty well in coming to the realization that for Christ to work in our lives, we need to be vulnerable and exposed. The disciples followed him. When they landed, dragging the net because they couldn't get it in, they saw a fire there with fish on it and some bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish that you've just caught. Simon Peter got up and pulled the net to shore. I, I try not to do this as often as I used to, but I got to go into the Greek here. Remember the Bible, the New Testament's originally written in Greek and you know, we do translation, but you don't always get the full picture. And the word here in our version, the other reading, Simon Peter got up and pulled the net to shore, has this notion of hauling, right? Um, you can picture the net, and it's heavy. He's got to haul it to shore. And the Greek there is helko. And it's used many times in John. And if you're in your Bible, I want you to turn to, to chapter 6, verse 44 in John. And we'll see that word. And I want you to see how it's used there. John chapter 6, verse 44. Actually, I'm going to go to 43 to set it up. Jesus is talking to them, and he says to them, Don't grumble among yourselves. No one can come to me unless they are hauled to me by the Father who sent me, and I will raise them up on the last day. Remember that one. Now turn to chapter 12, verse 32, even better known. Jesus is talking, and he, um, he says, verse 32 of, of chapter 12, when I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw, I will haul everyone, I will draw everyone to me. Same word in the Greek, helko, all three times in chapter 6, chapter 12, and here in chapter 21. Simon Peter got up and hauled the net. He drew the net to shore. You see this by now, right? This isn't just a neat story about fishing, but Jesus and the church, they're at work here, and they need Christ to tell them how to fish, how to, how to go out into the world and cast their nets that people might come and be received and hauled in to who Jesus is and what he has for them. 
When I am lifted up, he says, I will draw all people. You know, we can draw up strategies, and, and we will. We'll, we'll talk about, you know, different kinds of things that we aren't doing that we need to do so that people know that we're here. I still talk to people just this week, twice this week, because uh, I was doing a funeral. And somebody says to me, oh, what church do you go to? Or what, what church are, are you at? What church are you the pastor of? I said, oh, No Street Community Chapel. Oh, that's the one by, by the Lincoln statue, right? No, 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 no. Uh, that's New North Church, great church. Pastor Bill's a great guy. Uh, but we're just down the street a little ways, right across from Tedeschi. Oh, I know where Tedeschi is. There's a church across from there? No lie. No lie. There's the people who live, who live in this area. Um, and, and so we'll talk about, you know, doing a better job of, of, of helping people know that we are here. That's, that's part of our responsibility. But what Jesus says here is that if you lift me up, I will draw people unto myself. If we'll open ourselves up to what God has for us to do, and when we faithfully do our best to follow what Christ wants us to do, particularly in worship, worship will always be the center part of who we are as a church. And when we lift him up, he says, I'll do the drawing. You can draw on your boards all you want and draw up plans, but he says, I will draw the people. I will haul the people in. And so Peter, it says, he got up and he hauled the net to shore. It was full of large fish, 153 of them. Now I know this is going to come up in Sunday school. 153. What is that about? We'll talk about some of those little things that people have said over the years. But for now, I just want you to know, it's a, it's a, lot, of, it's a lot of fish. It's a lot of fish. Yet, continuing the text, the net hadn't torn. This is confession. I'm not supposed to confess in a sermon because I'm supposed to preach the Word of God, but um, your pastor is a fearful person. Now you're saying, yes, you fear the Lord, Jeremy. Yes, I fear the Lord, but that's not what I'm talking about right now. I'm a, I, I fear conflict. Uh, I fear uh, ridicule. I'm looking at some of you, and you're, you're like looking into my eyes, like what happened when he was a kid? Yeah, that's, some of that's true. We could talk about that. We could talk about that. I fear doing things wrong. I fear things breaking that shouldn't be broken. I'm a fearful person. And, and I'm laying that down in front of you and in front of the Lord today to say, let's get over it together. Our, our, net, our net cannot handle 153 fish. It can't. It can't handle 12 cars or, or 85 people. It doesn't matter. The, the Lord <laughs> will take care of all of those details if we're just faithful to what he's asking us to do. It's so full large of fish that the net, though the net had not even torn, even with so many fish. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. None of the disciples could bring themselves to ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. When these things happen and we draw close to Jesus and we come and we let him feed us, we will know that it is the Lord. Jesus came, took the bread and gave it to them. He did the same with the fish. Jesus will continue to feed us. I don't have time to go into all the allusions here to go back into the Gospel of John, the feeding of, of, of the thousands in chapter 6. And, and there are times when Jesus feeds and he gives. And when we receive the food that Jesus gives, simple food, bread, fish, cup, we have all that we need from him. This was the third time, verse 14, this was the third time Jesus appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. When they finished eating, Jesus asked Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Now for a moment, I just, you know, scholars deal with this passage in different ways. With Peter and, and, and his walk on the beach with Jesus, and some say it's for the leaders in the church and they need to particularly pay attention to that, and I think that's true. There's a lot here for pastors and, and those who take care of people in the church, but I think this is for you guys too this morning. We'll receive it together. When they'd finished eating, Jesus asked Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Simon replied, yes, Lord, you know I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my lambs. Jesus asked a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Simon replied, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, take care of my sheep. Then he asked a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter was sad this time. 
And then Jesus asked him a third time, do you love me? And so Peter replied, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Sheep are such a, and shepherding is such a huge image in Scripture, right? We've got Psalm 23. We've got David, the shepherd king. We've got Jesus born in, in, in the stable amongst the, the animals and the sheep. And throughout John, particularly the Gospel of John, Jesus is the great shepherd. I am the great shepherd. And, and he uses illustrations about sheep. And one of the ones I want to bring to mind this morning is when Jesus says, when there are a hundred sheep, one of them goes missing. And, and the shepherd, what the shepherd does, this shepherd, he says, he leaves those 99 and goes out and finds the, finds the one that is missing. We all have people who we know are the lost sheep I, I prayed in my prayer this morning about a friend of mine who, now that I'm being video recorded, I'm not going to say his name again, but who is now homeless because of mental, ch- mental health challenges, is on the streets. Uh, he, he is a lost sheep. And, and it'd be easy enough for me or his, or his parents who I'm praying with to, to say, bummer, let's move on. But Jesus says, no, we go and we find those sheep. Leaving behind forsaking for a little while the ones who are in the fold to go out to the dangerous peril, that it, whatever it may be, to find that one sheep. Jesus says, well, let me set it up a little bit more. Remember what I said, the center, the, the center ethos of our church is, and this is beautiful, we need to keep this. We love each other, and we love Jesus. Jesus says, if you love me, take care of my sheep. If you love me, you will take care, you will feed my sheep. We have, we all have family members that we could put in that category. And, and it may not be us. It may not be us. But what part of what we need to do is remember This isn't a new thing in the church. It's a new thing for our church. Remember this call for us to find the lost sheep. Let me finish. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. I assure you that when you were younger, you tied your own belt and walked around wherever you wanted. When you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and another will tie your belt and lead you where you don't want to go. If you had asked me a couple months ago, would I still be here at this moment, and I had to answer you honestly, I would have said no. Um, for a variety of reasons I'll share with, ne- with you next week. And I don't mean to say I didn't want to be here. I do want to be here. In fact, it's a big part of why I still am. But there were other things that were calling to me that I really, really wanted to do that it was clear the Lord said, no, I have work for you here. Things that I told you about a long time ago you haven't done yet, and other new things as well. I always find this part of the passage difficult, but it came to life to me in a new way this week. Jesus talking to Peter, I assure you that when you were younger, you tied your own belt and did whatever you want. (laughs) That's what Jesus is saying. But as you grow older, Someone will lead you where you don't want to go. And sometimes we have to respond to that with the Lord. Yeah, yes, I know we can talk about in Sunday school the allusions to Peter's death here and what's happening with that. We can talk about that. But I think it's meaningful for me and for us this morning as well. And finally, the last verse, and it all begins here. This is where it begins with Jesus. For those who've known him for a long time and for those who are finding him uh, more later in life. Verse 19. After saying this, Jesus said to Peter, follow me. And we think back to the first time that Jesus met Peter. What's Peter doing? He's fishing. And he's out fishing and he's going he's gonna to build up his dad's fishing business and he's going to make money and he's going to be the best fisherman in all of Galilee. And this stranger comes along and he says, what? Follow me. 
And I still can't un- explain why the disciples just do it. They don't give us much detail in the Gospels. It, it's just, but it says, Peter got up, he left his nets, and he followed. And this started this three-year journey with Peter with Jesus and all the disciples with Jesus. And he's teaching them and telling them what's going to happen. And then he, he, he gets arrested, he gets beaten, he's crucified, he dies, he raises again uh, from the dead in three days. And then they're on a beach together again. And Peter's been fishing. And I'm, I, don't have, I just did it all, but all of these words about loving and feeding sheep and, and all of those things, and the last thing Jesus says is the first thing Jesus says. Peter, follow me. This is an invitation to us at all times, but particularly for us right now in this season. And so, come back next week. <laughs> and let's see where the Lord is asking us to go.